Hello, namaste and jambo from here, from in Kenya. It's my great pleasure to start off with introducing our distinguished panelists, some of them wearing many caps, ranging from being scientists, visionaries, technology inventors, yes, inventors, entrepreneurs, and influential global voices. So I start off with Harry Lovenstein. Harry. Uh, Harry Lovenstein's background is in run of agroforestry research. He's currently heading the research and development at Landlife Company, a Netherlands-based nature restoration company operating worldwide. Next, we have Dr. Joyce Herrera. Joyce. Uh, Joyce has a bit of internet problems, so she will be joining us on the phone. And as and when, if we lose her, we will try and, uh, uh, and, uh, and see how we can accommodate what Joyce might have to say. So Joyce, if you're there, you can say hello. Not yet. Hello. Okay, hello, hello. everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you, you. Jo Thank you, Joyce. Uh, then we have Dr. Lauren, uh, so sorry, about Joyce. Joyce is a biologist, researcher at Embarapa, Amazonia Oriental. She has been conducting research in the Amazon for 20 years, covering solutions to reconcile environmental, uh, environmental conservation, agriculture, and forest use. She's also the co-founder of Sustainable Amazon Network. There she is, I can see Joyce there. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Lauren Fletcher is our next uh, distinguished guest. Dr. Lauren Fle Fletcher is the inventor and the visionary behind tree planting drone technology. Um, he founded Better Earth to develop and distribute technology solutions to aid the restoration of global of global scale ecosystems and drives social uplift at all levels of society. Welcome, Lauren. And then last but me. not least, we have Nicole Schwab. Nicole is a co-director of the platform to accelerate nature-based solutions and 1T.org at the World Economic Forum. Uh, welcome, Nicole. Um, so welcome to all of you. But just to give you a little bit of a background here. So yes, forest and landscape restoration is the rage right now. And we are all part of that bandwagon and that's why we are here. With techniques spanning from natural regeneration to tree seed planting or direct seed sowing, all of which are very relevant for different situations. Vanya, they are all relevant for different situations. Recent dialogue has, and even earlier, are arguing between natural regeneration against, against deliberate planting. In fact, they are complementary strategies of landscape restoration that depend on the context, such as the level of forest remaining in the landscapes and the purpose of restoration. We all know too well, however, that often when it comes to planting, people think of monocrops of a single species or they plant only those species that are easily accessible or are easy to propagate. That's very well known. When restoration is done badly, the considerable effort that, that are made are wasted. And worse still, planting often has undesirable undesir consequences. To overcome planting pitfalls, science and technology has generated a richness of knowledge and a range of promising technological solutions. In combination, these can maximize and balance restoration programs, multiple ecological and social goals. We really don't have time to talk about the whole range of advancements, but just to give you a feel, we have technologies ranging from the humble biodegradable seedling bag in nursery technologies to gene mining and landscape genomics methods. These last allow us to understand gene flow and species population structures to help choose the right species, the right tree for the right place for the right purpose, our mantra. We also have earlier presented species 
uh, Roland presented, uh, role species-specific vegetation maps and mobile apps to identify quality seed sources and for recommending what to plant where. On top of this, we have drones. I'm fascinated by drones. We have drones and satellites for forest monitoring, and I will not to steal his thunder and wait for them to talk about it. There are, of course, many, many more technologies, both old and emerging. All these support landscape restoration in some way or another. So we are very fortunate to be able to have to have a conversation with some of the outstanding developers and users of such techniques and technologies. They will talk to us about the approaches they use, both tried and tested techniques and groundbreaking, all supporting the best outcomes we all want to achieve for forest and landscape restoration. So I'll start off with Harry. To Harry, Harry, with climate change, we are already seeing sh shifting habitats for tree species happening very quickly. How can your technology or how can technology ensure that we don't have the wrong trees in the wrong place? Harry. Thank you, Ramni, for this very challenging question. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Greetings from the Netherlands. And when I'm looking outside, I already see the trees starting turning in beautiful autumn colors. So unfortunately, I cannot show you that to you yet, but nonetheless. Yeah, regarding your question, um, we at Landlife Company work with the concept of data-driven planting to ensure that we have the right tree at the right spot and also I learned at the right per for the right purpose. And for this, we're actually making use of a tree database and we're currently tracking 30,000 tree species, uh, trees comprising of about 400 uh, species ranging from drylands to temperate zones. And we relate that data to soil and climate conditions. And our objective is to track every tree which goes into the ground, and uh, which means that from every tree we have GPS locations and since trees don't walk away, we can keep on tracking them. And we track them already from the first uh, year when they're still very small and we have for this a, a propriety app developed a land life company. And when the trees grow a little bit bigger, over one to two meters, they are being picked up by a drone. And even when they grow even further, we pick them up as satellite. And these data, that's really essential for uh, large-scale uh, reforestation efforts to mitigate uh, climate change. And uh, to give you an idea of the perspective of the, the size of trees we are planting, this year only we'll uh, hit the three million trees. And next year we try to double that or at least triple that. So things are going very fast and we get a lot of information of that. And we need to move fast. And, uh, and also to be successful to keep up or rather overtake the climate change acceleration, as I would put it. And uh, based on the data we are collecting now, we can design the tomorrow's planting maps in which will be offered in some kind of a digitized format to control our tree planting machines. And iteratively, we keep collecting data points every time when the tree goes into the ground. So we are getting and planting smarter every tree. Fantastic. And um, for this purpose, we're also experimenting with what we, uh, what you know, of assisted migration and trying to stick to indigenous species, but then using provenances, which are, for example, more tolerant or more heat uh, tolerant. And these trees also then will be monitored into our database. And actually, I would also like to uh, not only focus on the tree species, but we're also looking at different tree configurations, species mixes and species densities, because we know that trees and communities can help protecting each other. And uh, so it's not about the single tree, but the community of trees we try to address here. And uh, from that perspective, having mentioned that in our database, we are checking trees and also soil and climatic conditions, we want to ensure that we have proper tree establishment because especially the first years are the most challenging parts of moment for trees to get established. And at tree planting, we're also looking at, for example, the impact of soil amendments, for example, microbiological amendments like mycorrhizae, or trying to see what we can do to improve the root system. Uh, we're also looking at uh, protection, uh, especially against grazers, using biorepellents or biodegradable shelters. And I think, especially when you move to uh, drier uh, geographies, 
We're also looking at the opportunities for soil and water conservation techniques as well. And all this blends in our giant database we are currently developing. Thank you. That's uh, you kind of also tell us about the, that also includes the model of land life company uh, to make trees successful and profitable. Um, uh, thank you. I just my question, are your databases going to be accessible to the public or is it proprietary? Well, <laughs> at the moment it, it's propriety, but uh, we are working together with various universities, so we we'll certainly will uh, publish on it. Okay. especially on the integrated results well, but i also would you. like to uh, to come back on your question about the successfulness i mean this data indeed is serves a scientific purpose to improve our models because by collecting the data we can explore the, the performance of future climates but also the data feeds into what we call a customer portal to uh, engage our clients in uh, in tracking their trees we actually looking for compliance complete transparent system. From that respect, we are sharing information okay. and to make sure that people are involved and keep on protecting the trees longer term. Um, thank you. Um, and just a very quick, quick answer, uh, Harry, from your explicit experiences. What is the biggest mistake being made uh, by tree planting initiatives? Well, the usual suspects obviously are the monoculture and invasive species. And I think also the fact that sometimes people are ignoring the hydrology or the water balance that trees are using up more water than is collected, especially in drylands. But I rather mm. like to focus on the fact that uh, planting, there is often a lack of soil preparation, which means that water will not properly infiltrate or you have difficulties with weed control. Those things I think uh, are sometimes a mistake when you plant trees. I mean, you can have dry tree, but you don't treat it properly. And as I mentioned also, uh, I think a big mistake would be not involving the stakeholders. You need people engagement for okay. longer term yes. success. And we've heard a lot about that today in today's session. I, uh, you I guess know, so. an, in, an integrated approach to Lauren. Do you, you know, you're, you're an inventor. Will technology help us meet these, meet these difficult challenges or is it just false hope? I have to unmute myself. Hi, thank you so much, Romney, and and uh, and uh, and hello to everybody out there who's listening to us. We appreciate your time uh, spent listening to us. Uh, in in addressing that question, look, I I want to step it back just a second <clears throat> because it really comes down to this: we really need to think about what is the scale of the size of the problem that we are trying to address, and we need to think in really big numbers. So if you look at all the research out there the big number that really pops out is two trillion. And that's with a T, two trillion trees are needed to be planted around the world in order to restore global scale ecosystems and, and get us back to where we, we, we need to be. And this is really important because when we do this, this restores global scale ecosystems. This improves and expands biodiversity. This restarts the soil nutrient cycles and the hydrological cycles. Mm -hmm. This increases downstream productivity so that you get more food growing. And then finally, of course, you, you provide social uplift to, to the entire uh, world because this affects all of us in, in a direct way. So this is the size of the scale of the problem that we're, we have to address. And when we think about it in that terms, we also have to realize that the way that we have planted trees forever has, has really been like this. When I first started taking a look at technology for tree planting, did a Google search, I said reforestation equipment, and what I got was a picture of these really big pieces of equipment that did one thing and one thing really well, and that's extract every penny out of the resource possible. But when I went around and I said, no, 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 tree planting equipment, what I got was a bunch of pictures of people with a bag of saplings on their shoulder. And that mm -hmm. was as automated as we got in terms of reforestation equipment. Mm -hmm. Now, between my time at NASA, taking a look at remote sensing and AI and robotics and looking at emerging technologies, especially drones, that's where I came across the idea of saying, wow, there's something where we can, we can combine technologies we know that, that work for us and help us, you know, AI, machine learning, data, data rich, and the emerging technology of, of drones to be able to automate this in a way that makes sense. It helps us get to that larger scale. It helps us be able to uh, get to places that we just can't get people. And we, it helps us do it at a large enough scale that makes a sense with precision, allowing us to plant 
each individual tree at each location possible using that rich data set and get it out to that hundreds of billions of trees uh, that, that is where we need to be thinking. So that is the hope that it's supposed to be helping us do. Now the tree planting drone technologies work typically in, in, in two different ways. You've got general seed spreaders. So think of like if you have that seed spreader in your hand and you're, you're spreading grass. So you can mount this underneath the drone and it spreads the seeds. So you can do grasses, you can do ground species, you can do lots of different types. If you're looking at at um, individual trees, more often what you're doing is you're taking either a seed ball, which is being done in, in a lot of great companies around the world now, or, or more uh, advanced technologies which encapsulate it in some sort of a bioplastic, and then you'll fly above the earth with these drones. It could be 20, 30 meters above the ground, that's it. You have a planting pattern that you've already generated from your data sets, and then you launch one at each specific location. Now, to give you an idea of scale, uh, at, at the company where I, I invented all of this, we were planting at 120 a minute, each drone. And then if you get a swarm, what that means is, is that a swarm of, of two or three pilots working with 10 drones, at 120 a minute each drone, you're looking at a capacity for each team of around 400,000 a day. In comparison, mm -hmm. hand planting will get you hundreds of trees per day uh, on a typical basis around the world. And so this is really a tool that enables those same exact tree planters to help them go faster and farther. And yes, there are limits to it, but um, you know those limits also include that you're not planting saplings, you're planting seeds. And once you plant those seeds, let's just, they, they start to germinate and grow because you've put in the right types of nutrients and everything else you need to make it uh, grow into a healthy tree. But you still have the same issues and associated with competition with local ground species and um, predators. And you, you still need to take a look at how it grows and when it grows. And let's be very clear about technology. Technology is great. I love technology, but you have to you, you have to think of it as your tool. When it's the right tool for the right job in the right location, you use that. But everything has to be at hand in order for us to get to two trillion trees. And that includes really great solutions like what the team is doing at Landlife, who has been one of their biggest fans forever. I love their work. Um, but also big scale aircraft and hand planting is going to always be a part of the solution but let's give those hand planters a new tool that makes them more effective and more efficient that benefits everybody around the world. Thank you, that's uh, wonderful. It's actually almost like you've also answered the second question I had, but how has this improved tree planting and what opportunities does it open up for large areas of the planet that could be restored? And. Uh, Maybe you want to add a little bit to that. I I, I do I do and you know there's there's lots of different things that that become problematic when you do think about that about that scale, um, you know accessing capital we yes. the, here's one of the big problems. The, look, yeah. the world is spending money. Governments have made commitments to plant trees on an annual basis. We're looking at about fifty billion dollars that's spent around the world, and yet we're still net negative. We're still losing on the order of of mm -hmm. six to ten billion trees a year. If we're trying to get to two trillion and we're net negative every year. We're never going to get there. So, so we need to have stronger government commitments that um, will unlock, unlock capital pools uh, large enough to be able to do this. Now, the other problem is, is that, you know, nothing against hand planting, which is an important part of the, the equation. The problem was with hand planting and especially existing organizations is, is that most of them will um, run, say, a couple of million, two, three million dollars a year on a, on a big hand planting team. When you're trying to mobilize 50 billion dollars a year, those organizations, UNE, governments, they're going to mobilize a billion dollars. They can't manage, you know, all of those fractured market of two or three million dollar project sizes because the overhead associated with managing that is really problematic. So we need to figure out smarter ways to combine all of our efforts into larger project sizes. So if we're working with land life and hand planting organizations and Trillion Tree Org, and we can put together $500 million project sizes, that's when we're really gonna turn that dial over. And I think that's one of the biggest issues across all of us is how do we more effectively uh, access capital and mobilize it in a way that makes sense. Yes, and that's why you should be talking to Resilient Landscapes after this, con uh, after yes. this conference. Um, uh, a new venture uh, with a great ambition. 
Uh, thank you. To Joyce. Uh, Joyce, you there? Yes. Hi, Joyce. Uh, you have a lot of experience, uh, and I wanted to hear about natural regeneration from you. It's a powerful tool and a cost-effective tool. Uh, tell us how you, uh, how and where it has worked for you in in your work in in Brazil. Yeah, I'm. I'm so I can without the video. Uh, so uh, I'm speaking from Berlin in the Eastern Amazon, and. Uh, it's important that uh, natural regeneration, uh, we observe that can be very effective here. Uh, for example, in the Amazon, there are around 130,000 square kilometers of naturally regenerating forests, and mainly resulting from abandoned agricultural land because around 20% of all land that were deforested before Become, became uh, secondary forests. So they bring a lot of uh, benefits. Our research are demonstrating that, uh, for example, at around four years, uh, secondary forests have recovered more than 8% of the primary forest levels in terms of carbon and biodiversity. Of course, they are not, we you could not observe they are uh, the same as primary forests, but they have a very high levels of biodiversity and carbon. So the strategy implies low costs. Basically, it needs fencing. Uh, it demands a small working force, not necessary nurseries and preparing uh, seedlings and so on. But it's important to consider a win uh, or why natural regeneration is possible in most of places in the Amazon and other uh, places that are similar. Uh, so natural regeneration is favorable in most areas of the Amazon because uh, they have relatively recent land use chains. Uh, they are relatively recent in the region, let's say 30, 50 years, some uh, even less. Uh, also, the main uh, agriculture activities, they have very low intensity. Uh, for example, traditional agriculture with horses and also extensive pastures. Uh, and uh, one very important thing is the high forest cover in the landscape and also the good climatic conditions. For example, we have a very uh, abundant uh, rainfall, uh, nice temperatures. So all of those factors favor natural regeneration in most parts of the region. But of course, it's not always so successful. It depends on the context. The rate of carbon accumulation uh, changes of various uh, seven to ten times among different sites just in paradise states. So imagine across the Amazon. And in the oldest deforestation frontier that is almost devoid of a natural forest, of a primary forest, the carbon uh, low. Uh, and we should naturally recover after intense land use, uh, like mechanized, mechanized agriculture, uh, they are not known so far. The capacity of regeneration for de that case, we are, we are not aware of it. There are not uh, many studies on, on this. But what is more important is that there are many opportunities for not it is still possible and we should take advantage of it. Oh, thank you, Joyce. Uh, uh, we lost a bit, but I think we have the general gist of what you were saying. At least uh, all the way here, I could hear almost 70 to 80%, and uh, that was useful. Just a question, uh, do, do policy makers consider natural regeneration enough? I mean, uh, can we encourage them to do more? Uh, are they interested yeah, to do more? It's a very good question. Uh, in fact, uh, 
we realize that there is much more enthusiasm about tree planting, even in situations when they wouldn't be necessary at all. So I think it's something to be studied. Uh, so people take then uh, taking care of uh, trees that are naturally growing. But anyway, despite of that, we can say that in recent years, in Brazil at least, the most important piece, of, for example, uh, the most important one at the national level is the, the forest code, as we call here. And the, the, this forest code that was revised some years ago recognizes second forest as one of the options to restore areas mm -hmm. uh, by farmers who have forest uh, debit. So this is at national level. At uh, state level here in Pará, a uh, decree was launched uh, very uh, recently, pledging to reach, uh, uh, it's a commitment to net uh, zero carbon emission by 2035. And uh, it's basically through reducing deforestation and allowing second, for, secondary forests to grow. So, uh, uh, there are also other initiatives, for example, the Ministry of Environment uh, prepared a document with uh, many, a lot of scientists uh, to map the areas with natural uh, regeneration capacities. So there are many different uh, actions towards uh, recognizing natural regeneration as an important tool or an important strategy for restoration. But so far, there are no strict regulations for the different Amazonian states and uh, what we can clear cut in a very high rate. For example, uh, studies are showing uh, had 40% higher in secondary than in primary forests. Uh, so basically, we need more regulations to protect forests that are naturally recovering and to take this opportunity uh, because it's really important. Oh, thank you, Joyce. Uh, I, I definitely have to get in touch with you because there are bits I missed out. But uh, I, I think there's a lot of interesting work going on and uh, definitely you, your governments have, um, uh, they do have a lot of good intention and uh, I'd like to hear more about it. Um, I now would like to ask Nicole. Uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Oh, hi, Nicole. Okay, Nicole, I have a very interesting question for you. Um, if you were in charge of something like the Bond Challenge, how would you go about designing a program to plant trees? At least in the areas where tree planting is appropriate, we don't want to, we accept it that we need both. So let's stick to tree planting now. How would you handle it? How would you make that program? Thank you very much, Ramni, for another very challenging question. And so I don't um, pretend to have the answers. I mean, hundreds of people have been working on this for, for decades, uh, but I'm very happy to, to get some, some insights also in terms of why the World Economic Forum is now engaging in this space of, of forest landscape restoration. Um, and I think that's part of the answer because um, I believe that commitments are really important. I mean, we've seen how these commitments kind of can mobilize people, can get traction, can start to put um, an issue on the agenda. So I think the, the commitment side continues to be very important. And I've just heard from Harry that it shouldn't be one trillion trees, but two trillion trees. So let's continue to expand our, our ambition. But of course, the, the question is, how do we translate these commitments into reality mm. on the ground, right? And that's really the, the, the tricky part of the, of the challenge. And I think that's where the, this concept of, of multi-stakeholder coalitions becomes so important. So how do we bring together the different actors that need to be part of a more holistic approach? And, and that's, of course, embedded in the concept of forest landscape restoration. But what does that really mean? And I think um, 
I, I just want to uh, point out maybe three three aspects of this, um, which are core to what we're trying to do with the World Economic Forum and the Trillion Trees platform, which is really here to be in support of all the actors out there that have been working on this and that have all the technologies that you've been hearing about and the science and the solutions. So I think the first point is really how do we make sure with this holistic approach that we address the drivers of deforestation and degradation in the first place so mm -hmm. that um, the restored forests don't then you know, fall into the same cycles and the same issues that caused the deforestation in the first place. And so something very important here, which we've been working on is the business case for restoration and how do we transition our industries to nature positive industries. So whether it's the forestry sector, whether it's the land use sector and agriculture. So how can we at the same time as we're using this incredible science and technology that we now have on our hands, to know exactly which tree needs to be planted where, how we can do it. Um, how can we at the same time look, take a step back and look at all these forces that have been converting uh, the land in the first place and transition to uh, nature positive industries. So that's one thing that we've been uh, looking at. And I mean, whether it's concepts of regenerative agriculture and, and really all these different forces that are on the landscape that we're looking at. Um, and I think this is where this really requires this capacity to look at systems change and to bring together the public and private sector actors. And this again touches upon what Lauren said about mobilizing financing at scale, right? So the first is how can we address, so if I was looking at this program is one, can we make sure we address the drivers? Two, how do we mobilize financing at scale, which is what we, we need if we're talking about these types of, of ambitions. And that means philanthropy is not gonna get us there. Um, we need uh, public sector financing, but we also need the private sector to engage. And We've um, estimated uh, as part of the last, uh, the New Nature Economy report series that um, the conservation, restoration and, and sustainable management of forests could generate $230 billion in business opportunities, could create 16 million jobs worldwide. Wow. So there's a clear business case. And I think that's, that can also be one of the drivers to start to mobilize additional financing in a way that's nature positive, that supports the restoration efforts. Uh, another point, of course, which is, uh, as we know, very challenging is the repurposing of subsidies and, and, you know, thinking about public incentives like payment for ecosystem services. And there's a whole, just like with what we're talking about here, there's also a whole bunch of new financial ways and approaches that can support these programs. And then the third point is then, so how do we connect these global commitments to the local communities? And how do we make sure that we align these incentives, not just at the global level or in terms of you know, the private sector, but really in terms of the local livelihoods? And, and it was interesting to hear from Joyce, um, you know, how, what they have been working on uh, in Brazil. Um, and, and I think there, there's something we need to take into consideration, which is the timelines. So on one hand, we have this timeline of urgency of um, the drones. And I, I mean, I love how we're you know, moving forward um, uh, in, in all these aspects. And then on the other hand, there's the timeline of actually building a coalition and getting, state, you know, getting people to feel ownership and to ensure that these trees actually are going to reach maturity and stay standing because the incentives of keeping them standing and alive um, you know, are greater than whatever forces to, to be cutting them down. So this is just a, a brief, um, you know, attempt to say what are the ingredients of, of what is this much more comprehensive approach. And I, I do believe that um, uh, very often, you know, when, when programs are maybe successful initially and, and they gain some successes, but then where, where it's a shortfall is because one of these other factors and levers was not sufficiently addressed because of the sheer complexity of it. And then we have these setbacks. And so is there a way in which today we can really think about our initiatives and projects in a way where we combine the best of science and we combine this landscape based mm -hmm. approach where we can bring all the stakeholders in and we can bring the private sector in. Um, and so that's what we're, um, we're supporting uh, best as we can to raise um, ambition at the highest level, but then to help to support bringing in those actors and making sure that it connects to the projects yeah, on the ground. It's a very holistic approach indeed. And I just, you know, I did start off by saying if you were born challenge. So are you working with born challenge? 
Are you trying to influence that or are they trying to influence you? Are you taking the best from both approaches? I think it's a, it would be a great communication. Yeah, so I think we see, you know, the one challenger and, and of course, uh, um, we've just started out with challenges. We see ourselves as being in service to the UN decade for ecosystems restoration. So being in service to all these commitments and mobilizing the private sector to join and to, you know, play its part along with this bigger um, work on building the business case and more these, these nature positive industry transitions, which is slightly outside of the scope of, of the trillion trees, but yeah. actually has a direct influence um, in terms of those enablers. Thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us know what your ambitions are and uh, very achievable, but also a tough job. Uh, I think it's a, but uh, yes, well, we're happy to work with you. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I have one more question, but anyone really can answer and if you feel like just say that. I mean, you know, trees and forests contribute Contribute, trees and forests' contribution to mitigating climate change by absorbing carbon is one of the reasons there is considerable enthusiasm around tree planting uh, at the moment. What is the best way, do you think, to get the maximum benefit from trees' uh, carbon sequestration potential, but also all the other benefits they bring? What would be the best way to get, again, the holistic so I'm not, I'm not going to answer this from the, the scientific perspective. I think That's I will let okay. my co-panelists who know much more about that um, in terms of getting the maximum benefit on, on the carbon sequestration potential. Um, but what I do want to just mention briefly is I think uh, we have an incredible opportunity because um, the, the, you know, the incentives around addressing climate change and, and the, the net zero targets, along with the increasing realization of all the other benefits of trees is really coming together. And, and yes. that's also why there is this mobilization um, of more companies and, and private sector in this space. So I think um, there's huge interest and the, the, the clear we can show some of these examples. I mean, we've been hearing from some of them today also of projects that can meet those needs. I think that will really help to continue the, the mobilization here. Yeah, I saw uh, Lauren's hand up. Lauren, yeah. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, I, I, I wanna go, I wanna say, address two different things, but the first one is going to your question on the carbon. Look, I always struggle with the 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 carbon question, and and I got to say that you know I have enough conservative friends who are are sort of anti climate change and you know anti carbon atmospheric, and it's always a challenge. And so, you know the way I the way I think about it is is that if we go out there and we plant two trillion trees and we restore global scale ecosystems, we get these nice healthy forests, we get this amazing biodiversity. Uh, we get the soil cycles, the nutrient cycles, we have social uplift, we have income generation at all levels of society. And you know what? That's super easy to sell. People get mm -hmm. that. And then, oh, by the way, when we happen to plant two trillion trees, we happen to suck down a whole lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and we've got this additional amazing benefits. But I, I tend to lead with the benefits first and then come in with, oh, by the way, we just happen to do all this climate change stuff. And isn't that amazing as well? So that's kind of how I think about it. And I'd love to hear what other people think about it. But I also want to um, to riff on, on what Nicole had to say about multi-stakeholder. And so when I created the, the first company, it was really this centralized model. It was a very Silicon Valley uh, technology mentality of you, you create a technology and you corner that market and you make a lot of money for your investors. And I think one of the risks there is, is that for too long, we have been thinking that maximizing shareholder value means for the shareholders and nobody else. And if we were to start thinking about how do we more effectively distribute revenue and fair rate of return to the entire value chain, mm -hmm. then yeah. what we end up doing is, is that if we can push more economic benefits at the entry level, at the lower level, we create environmental stewards at the local level, and those are the ones that are going to be the people that protect that. And so when I started rethinking through that, I, I felt that the centralized model was the wrong way to go. And at Beta Earth, I'm working with a Swiss NGO called We Robotics, W-E, We Robotics, which is an amazing organization that creates drone solutions and distributes it around the world, but 
not through, a, not through a centralized model, through a franchise. So they create the technology, they create the training, and then they distribute that to those local countries. And they're doing mosquito vector delivery, they're doing cargo. But one of the things they've been missing is a tree planting solution. So we're working with them to create a tree planting solution that we can distribute to the local organizations that can do projects on the $10,000 scale, as opposed to the centralized model, which requires you to have multi-year, multi-million dollar annual contracts in order to justify that to your, to your shareholders and to your investors. And, and that's always been, and, and there's lots of room for that, but what we're missing is the majority of the market, which is fractured small scale landholders. How do we provide technology solutions that enable them to do it so that they get the benefits so that they become our environmental stewards. And so I'm, I'm really excited to be able to talk about how we can do it at the right level for the right tool because we need different tools and different approaches. So, so thank you for talking about that, Nicole, because I think it's super, super important. Um, yes, Harry, you have your yeah. hand up. Also, would like uh, to chip in here. I really believe that uh, the carbon market is a wonderful way to get, is a wonderful vehicle to get trees uh, started or get planting trees. But when it comes to climate change, I really would like also to address the hydrological benefits of planting trees that has a much faster uh, impact on, on climate change than just only the carbon. Carbon is much longer term. And we look at, at hydrological uh, systems you may be able at certain points, I mean, there is this theory on the biotic pump, which needs to be proven that you can improve rainfall in other areas. I think that has also far more bigger impact if, we, if this uh, theory is act accurate. But also I think for people who are planting a tree, they can immediately enjoy sitting in the shade of the tree and enjoy the, uh, the moderate temperatures. And that's instant climate change for people who are working there for these uh, local stakeholders. Yes, it's like the sun coming right on my face right now. <laughs> the shade. Uh, yes, uh, I actually uh, I, I'm totally bought by that. We we yes, while there's climate uh, carbon sequestration, we need to go with the livelihood benefits and the environmental benefits those trees are, and really that is probably one of the good ways to sell. Um, I, I, my my client is a smallholder farmer, and um, and for me that's probably the easiest way to sell it, unless of course they start seeing big money in their in the trees standing in the carbon, and which my part of the world have not. So uh, I think they would see the timber, and they would see the fruit, and they would see the medicinals, and that would give them the encouragement. Uh, to actually plant trees and keep trees in the ground. Um, of course, we need the markets for them too. And that is another challenge and we're not addressing that here in any way. Uh, but if the markets are not there, then they rather plant uh, rice and mung bean. So there is a lot of incentives uh, also that need to be addressed. How do we incentivize? Or is there payment for services? I, I I am not, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I feel these trees belong to the planet and uh, those who can afford it should pay for it because there are lots of good people on my part of the world who could benefit from pay, this payment so that they can keep this public good out in the land. It is a public good, our trees. Um, so, you know, I, I have, thank you. I, I have, uh, coming, I'm coming to our final questions. And I'm very happy the Slido has already kind of shown uh, that yes, tree plantings, uh, getting access to planting material, quality planting material is essential. And I'm being selfish here. I am about tree genetic resources and I'm always harping on about how important it is that people are not here. It's how sad it is when a lot of investment goes into planting and not enough attention has been paid to to the planting material. So I would like to ask you four, uh, three or uh, four of you, if I can see Joyce, uh, you know, how do you, what is your key challenge with planting material? Very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time now. Do you have a, a challenge with planting material? I mean, it's the cost or it's the availability or it's the genetics, it's, what is it? Uh, can I start with Harry? Yes, very quickly, Harry. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'll keep it short. Yeah, uh, we like provenance selection obviously is very important, but from my point of view, there's no point of planting the right tree on the right spot if it doesn't survive or prosper the first year. 
So we ha really have to make sure planting trees that we give the fair chance and that would be a challenge yes. for us. Yes. Okay. Uh, Lauren, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think when, when you know when I when I talk two trillion trees in a scale, it's like where do you get two trillion seeds? <laughs> and yes. So there's there's yes. a lack of local access to a good yes. seed supply that is actually the seed that you're looking for, and so so that's that's part of the big challenges as well. So Lauren, there are lots of people who would love to collaborate with you to make that a reality. We're already doing this in Ethiopia, by the way, where we have an ambition to bring 250 seed sources for 250 prime prioritized tree seeds. So we, my personal dream is to take it to the whole of Africa and as is for my team. So come join, we would love to join with you all and take this, make this a reality. Nicole, do you want to add something? You, you've seen the Slido's, uh, tree planting material is a challenge. So what do you have? What thoughts do you have? Are you taking well, that into your dialogue? I can just echo what I'm hearing from, you know, the people were, were hearing from and i think the nursery's capacity is is really always at the top of the list so i'm very happy to yes. hear that you you, have, you are developing some some approaches excellent excellent um joyce are you can you hear us uh, do you want to very quickly say something because we're we have to close now okay okay so yes. i think there are two main uh, points that i'd like to highlight here the one the first one is droughts so i think droughts are becoming more frequent in our region uh, so normally there is a high expectation for installing irrigation systems but these are expensive higher demand for water can impose environmental risk to the water bodies and so this is really important to consider Irrig mm -hmm. Irrigation cannot be the, the solution, but we need to think about uh, species selection and species mixing the landscape. And the second one is fire. This represents a serious threat to restoration in the regions. They are becoming more frequent. They are escaping in the landscape. So it's necessary to include fire prevention in the restoration programs. So those, there are many, Thank many uh, yes. challenges, but I would highlight those two. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you all of you. Thank you for your time and thank you for a great opportunity to, I'd heard some about some of you, but now I've met you and I'm really delighted and I'm sure the audience are delighted to, to meet you, to see you and link up with you if they wish to. Thank you and wishing you all the very best and happy planting and let's work together. Namaste. Kwaheri. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanya. Thank you all of you.